the last five to 10 years, the greatest advances in my field of eating disorders has actually come from the field um, of neuroscience. And what neuroscience has done is it's helped us break some of the key myths that are out there about eating disorders, particularly about anorexia nervosa. And I'm going to spend my time this afternoon smashing out some of those myths. Um, and the other thing about presenting up here, which is kind of interesting, is taking the data from neuro neuroscience, some of which Samash has talked about, um, we're starting to use mindfulness-based practices in our treatments of our patients. And so this is a slide that was done by a, a patient of a colleague of mine because she was angry about the first myth about eating disorders, which is that they're a rare illness. When we think eating disorders, that's what we think. And that is a quite a rare presentation. That's someone with um, severe anorexia nervosa, and that's about half of 1% of the population. What this slide says, and what you notice about this slide, is that there's people of all shapes and all sizes. There's someone who's underweight, who may have anorexia nervosa. There's a large number of normal weight people who may have bulimia nervosa. Uh, there's some overweight people who may have what we call binge eating disorder. Um, there's women depicted there, or people depicted there, of different ages, young, middle-aged, and old. Eating disorders, again, don't discriminate. And our young figure on the end here is a male, which we see increasingly more in, in uh, our practice. And when we think about that definition of eating disorders, we start to understand that this isn't a rare illness, that around 15% of Australian women, this is data from Adelaide, will suffer from significant clinically impairing symptoms of an eating disorder. So 15% is not a rare illness. So that's myth number one. Myth number two is it's not really a very serious illness. Well, eating disorders, and again, anorexia nervosa specifically, has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. It's one of the few psychiatric illnesses you can actually die from. From the physical complications of uh, binging and purging and being underweight, the stress that that puts on your body. But the other way that people die from eating disorders, and again, particularly anorexia, is from suicide. More patients with uh, a diagnosis of anorexia will kill themselves than patients with a diagnosis of depression. And that gives us a really interesting insight into the horrible world of living with an eating disorder. And yet, as a society, and I hate to say a number of, a lot of clinicians, don't take this illness particularly seriously. And one of the great things that neuroscience has done is helped us understand it. So whenever I put that slide up and we got it here today, there was, oh, that's a really horrible picture. And it is a really horrible picture of a, of a human being who is suffering greatly. But if we dig a little bit deeper about what people generally think about this, this young woman, they will think a couple of things. She's probably from an upper econ socioeconomic group. So she's from the upper North Shore, where I come from, or she's from the eastern suburbs in Sydney. If you're watching the video, insert appropriate geographical area. She probably watches a lot of fashion TV, that she reads a lot of Vogue, she reads a lot of Cosmopolitan, and her idol is someone like Kate Moss, which possibly dates me. There's probably a younger, new model that's too thin. But largely what they think is that this is a narcissistic, self-obsessed self person who is uh, caught up in the social cultural drive for thinness and really she's selfishly starving herself to death in the pursuit of thinness at the expense of everything else. And that is why when we think of anorexia in particular as a disorder of the catwalk, that is why we don't take this illness seriously. 
And what neuroscience has done is it's kind of helped us understand the worldview, the hardwired worldview of somebody with an eating disorder. And I'll talk a little bit about a couple of things that they've helped us understand, because it helps us just rethink and reframe eating disorders. That's a picture of Monet's water lilies, which I noticed is replicated around the corner. So we could have done this outside and I could have used it a bit better. But if you've ever seen it, it's a really big picture. And you can spot the therapeutic metaphor about big pictures. Um, and so what you do to view it, he said, try not to fall off stage, is you stand right back to see the big picture. If you have probably a genetic predisposition um, to suffer an eating disorder, you look at it like that. You go up right close to it and you just look at all the details. So you look at a couple of pixels and you go, this is a wonderful picture. And that's called um, central coherence difficulties. And, f and, and uh, looking at the details is really good. I want my accountant to look at the details. And if I ever have brain surgery, I want a really obsessive, detail-focused brain surgeon working on me. The problem for people with anorexia is this thing called set shifting. Once they get locked into these fine details, and for them the fine details are control of weight, control of shape, control of emotion. These are the fine details, counting calories. These are the fine details which they get obsessed by. But what they can't do is set shift. They can't go from that fine detail to take a step back. So once they get locked in, they're not willfully making a choice just to focus on calories and weight and shape. They're hardwired not to be able to take a step back. It's not actually their fault. And so motivation for change is really difficult because they can't step back and see, although I've got control over weight and I've got control over shape and I can control my calorie intake, I can't see the effect it's having on my family, that I'm about to die, that my periods are stopped, my bones are brittle. Um, they can't see that. If they could, they would try and make a change. They can't take on new information. It's very difficult for them to take on new information. And they get really rule bound. And I was seeing a patient last week who discovered a rule that she didn't even know that she had. She has a rule that she must never start breakfast before her husband. The rule makes absolutely no sense. Um, she could not even remember where it came from. But it took us about six weeks working on it to change it because she's hardwired just to follow the rules. Another area where neuroscience has been really helpful in helping us understand is in this fascinating area of body image. And what you have there is, you know, a very, it's in every eating disorder kind of textbook, of an emaciated young woman looking at herself in the mirror and seeing something completely different to what everyone else sees. And what that does is it maintains the eating disorder. It baffled us for years. And still what we started to do was scan some brains. And this is a, a study, uh, I really like this study. It's by uh, Paminder Sandev at University of New South Wales. And I like it because a lot of my patients' brains are up there. And I also supplied the control group. They used a lot of my PhD students and a lot of my clinical master's students as the control group. So there's a whole lot of people I know whose brains amalgamated. And this is where I get to stand on this stage about to be followed by some of the world's greatest neuroscience. And I go, I know nothing about the brain. Well, not a little bit, but not, not that much. But looking at that, it's kind of like one of those pictures you get at the kid, the, as a kid that goes, spot the difference. What they did in this study was they photographed the control group, they photographed the patient group, they put them under fMRI, and they showed them the pictures of self, and the pictures of other. And they tried to measure the activity in the visuospatial area. You can kind of probably guess where this is kind of going, that 
in the red, with the red, is the control group. That when they look at pictures of themselves, they get a nice sort of kind of a picture at the back of their brain where you'd expect it to. When they look at others, they get the same activity. When a patient with an eating disorder looks at other people, they get pretty similar activity. When they look at a picture of themselves, there's not a lot kind of happening there. And so what we kind of say clinically, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but what we kind of say clinically is it's really hard for you because you do not get a picture of what you look like. So what does she base her body image on? Well, we go back to fMRI studies and we look at, well, what lights up? And what lights up when patients with eating disorders look at themselves is the amygdala, which is the fear centers. So they look at an image of themselves and they feel very frightened. And you can replicate this in lots of ways. You can show them pictures of food. Um, you can give them smells of food. And for us, our pleasure centers will light up. The, so if you show them a picture of hot chips, um, for us, you know, memories of pleasant holidays down at the beach or whatever will kind of light up. Our taste sensations will light up. For someone with an eating sort of fear will light up. So in a way, well, two things that are important happen. One is when we're frightened of something, it looks bigger. Cue any spider phobics here. If I had a picture of a spider here, it would look bigger to you than anybody else in the room. Evolution at work, fantastic. The other thing that happens when we're afraid is we avoid it. So if food is making you scared because there's a wiring problem in your brain, if food is making you scared, then you avoid it. If looking at yourself as bigger makes you scared, you avoid it and you try and fix the problem. It's not your fault that your brain is giving you pretty crappy information. So why is this important? Because if you go to any emergency room across the world and you ask them, who is the patients that really piss you off? Who don't you like? And they will, to a person, go, I really hate those selfish upper North Shore girls who are just starving themselves to death because they just want to be thin. And they'll get really bad treatment. In fact, a good way to get discharged from a hospital in New South Wales is tell them you have an eating disorder. They'll let you go out the door. We have this myth that neuroscience has helped us bust, that eating disorders are willful choices. Anorexia nervosa is a brain-based illness. To think of somebody willfully having an, a, an anorexic illness is like saying to somebody with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, well, stop willfully having that delusion about alien invasion. Just stop it. Not a hugely effective therapeutic technique, and yet for years our treatment of anorexia is just eat. It's the same thing. People aren't, people aren't really wired to do something that eventually leads to incredible suffering and increases your risk of suicide. Uh, people aren't wired to not eat. Yet, we kind of somehow blame patients with anorexia for what we're finding out is, is brain pathology. We don't have willful schizophrenics. It makes no sense to think that we have willful patients with an eating disorder. And so, neuroscience has been really important because the stigma is really because thinking of this as sort of a disease of the catwalk means people don't take the disease seriously. And that has important treatment outcomes. There are two beds, two public beds in New South Wales for people with eating disorders. And if you want to get into an activist frame of mind, I don't want to subvert people, but there's a website you can just check out. Run by patients who are sick of being treated as willfully and to blame for their, their illness. In terms of how this has helped treatment, one of the greatest problems with the stigma in eating disorders, the way that we think about eating disorders, is we used to blame families. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot of clinicians who still hold that view. In the, in the 50s, there was a term schizophrenogenic parenting, 
And of course, in psychology, when we mean parents, frankly, we blame, we, we mainly mean mothers. Um, there was a type of parenting that would lead to schizophrenia until, oh, whoops, it's a biological illness. Yet we still have this concept of an anorexogenic parent. And so what we did, following that kind of old view of, of thinking about eating disorders, we kept parents out of treatment. There's a great, hor oh, great, horrible saying about a parentectomy for these kids, based on kind of the myth that a therapist can take care of a child better than their parent can take care of a child. Just step back from that thought and realize it's kind of crazy. Um, because of neuroscience helped us change our frame, we started bringing parents into treatment. We stopped blaming parents. We brought them into treatment. We thought maybe these guys know what they're doing intuitively, and they could be a really helpful treatment resource. And when I say we, it really wasn't me. It was people at the Maudsley Hospital in, in London. And lo and behold, we now have a pretty effective treatment for child and adolescent anorexia nervosa, for which previously we didn't. And what it's helping me as, as a, as a clinical psychologist, is the data on set shifting means that probably just challenging a cognition like I'm fat is not going to be particularly helpful. So what we're doing more and more is helping people take a step back from their thinking, understand the processes, understanding that they have great difficulty in working out what the bigger picture is, so spending a lot of time in therapy looking at what's the bigger picture, and getting them to do what's called metacognitive therapy, which is let's help you think and know about these processes in your thinking. And for me, my personal opinion, and you gave me a microphone, so you're going to get my personal opinion, um, is that um, our field is slowly, because we're usually about 10 years behind every other psychological disorder, moving to incorporating mindfulness-based treatments, um, mindfulness-based therapies in, in our treatment. For all the reasons our previous speaker said, identify your thinking, step back from it, give choice. There's some pretty good data for patients with bulimia and binge eating disorder on using mindfulness-based treatment. Um, and so, thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me a space to help kind of hopefully send you home with a slightly different view of patients with eating disorders. It's not a willful kind of choice. It's a brain-based illness. Because a really important thing that that can do for me as a clinician and you as a community is actually to approach these guys with much more compassion than, than we do. And so that you know, in therapy, we can really start looking at helping these guys reach um, what is often great potential for these people. So thanks for your time.